I'm Ken Pooch Van Druten. And I'm Kevin Tater McCarthy. Welcome to the Tater Audio World Headquarters, and we are Locked, Locked Up, up with, with a Digico. Today, we are going to talk about OptiCore console send and receive, and how Tater and I set up our Quantum 7s to prepare for a new gig. We're in lovely downtown Detroit, Michigan, where our front of house and monitor Digico Quantum 7s are side by side to take you through how we set up our consoles from scratch. We have two Quantum 7s next to each other representing front of house and monitors connected to several SD racks via OptiCore. We have just powered our consoles on and our consoles are set to come up in a blank startup session. The preference for this is located in Options and Console tab. The load startup session preference should be checked to no in order for the console to start up with a blank session. Tater, tell us a reason why you prefer this. I like to start in a blank session because on initial fire up, in case I get distracted by a back line person or even need to go to catering, it confirms I have not loaded my session for the day. The first step after powering up is to structure my session for my needs. So under files is session structure. Let's go to Tater and find out how he sets his up. Okay, I see that this is the default on my Q7 today. And I know we're connected to an SD rack with 56 inputs. So with that in mind, I'm gonna change the 72 to 112 inputs. The aux buses mono and stereo are six apiece by default. I'm gonna double those also and go to 12 and 12. To the right of that is the aux order tab. If you push that, you are able to move your mono and stereos in the order you would like. Group buses, six and six. I think that's plenty for our needs today. Let's move on to matrix inputs and outputs. The default is 32. I think 32 is a bit much, even at monitors. Let's go down to 16 and 16. Last is control groups, which is 24. I'm gonna move that down to 12. Now, let's just keep an eye on our spare channel processing and spare bus processing. Just have that number in mind for later use in case you wanna restructure. Tater and I set up our session structure just a little bit different than each other but we do set up our input channels the same. So for instance, in this example, there is a 56 input rack, so we like to double the amount of input. So we wanna change the input channels to 112. But before I do that, let's look at the bottom here under channel processing. You can see right now there's 184 paths, but let's change the input channels to 112. You'll notice it changes channel processing to 144 paths now. So these are numbers down here that you kind of want to keep your eyes on as you change your session structure. Next thing are AUGS buses, six mono and six stereo. That's pretty good for me. Uh, the next one is group busing. Now group busing is where Tater and I differ the most. I tend to do busing into busing into busing. So for example, when I'm building my drums, I'll have a five total stereo group buses in order to build my drum sound. That's a drums, a drums parallel, a toms, a cymbal bus, all traveling into a drums overall stereo bus. Five total group buses. So you can see if I do that with drums and a bunch of other instruments, I can eat up stereo group buses very fast. So I like to put in 32 stereo group buses, that'll get me started. Then we have matrix inputs. 32 is a little much for me. I'm gonna change that to 24. Uh, matrix outputs, I'm gonna change that to 24 as well. Uh, control groups, I really only ever use 12. So let's make that change. The one last thing that I wanna show you is this clear waves button. When you activate that button, it does what it says. It clears your wave session when you restructure. Let's restructure. Now, once you have restructured, the console then prompts you to save the session. Let's go over to Tater and find out how he saves his session. 
I have my own unique way I prefer to save. This will help me later if I have to run my file through the Digico converter or send to another desk. I tap the file name box, and the first word I usually like to use is the band's name. We don't have a band today, I'm gonna to use Digico. Next, I like to put in the model number of the desk, which is today Q7. Then I like to put the software version, and the city we're in, which is Detroit. Then I like to put the number of the show if it's multiple shows. Once I push OK, we are going to save session. After the save is done, since we are on Q7s, we need to mirror the two engines. You go and tap the network tab, double check the engine you are already in, which I am in A. Let's make sure it's the audio master highlighted in beige, meaning all the audio will run through that engine. Let's send the session over to our engine B. Once it is there, the mirror to selected and mirror from selected will appear. Hit mirror to selected. You will see both engines will go green and say mirrored and also double check your waves mirroring in the corner. So I've developed a style of saving sessions that pretty much tell me without opening a session what is in that session. So what I do over here is uh, I put the date first is in my uh, file name. Uh, so today's date is the 15th and then my next thing is I usually put the band. So in this case, we're going to put Digico. And then I put the uh, name of the city that we're in. So without opening this file, I now know that what the date is, what the band is, and also uh, what city uh, we were doing it in. Um, one other thing I want to point out is this session title box. Um, I use this to put all kinds of notes. I'll give you an example. During rehearsals, if I'm sitting there working on guitars all day long, I want to make a note that that was the day that I was working on guitars. So I might just put something in there that just says guitars. And that just reminds me in that save, that was the day that I was working on guitars. Let's save. Great. The next thing that we're going to look at is the audio I.O. It's under setup and audio I.O. You'll notice that there are five default racks that have been created by the session, and one of my racks is in an error mode. So let's fix that. We go over here to rack one. We'll notice that the device is an SD rack and the connection is a MADI. So we want to fix that connection. So let's go to device type and change it to a MADI 64. Now we'll notice that that rack has gone in into an OK mode and we are ready to move forward. By default, the Q7 has four I.O. ports. Other Digico models may vary. You can manipulate these ports, but please do not delete them, as you may run into some issues down the road if you need to use the file conversion or send your file to another desk. Now, on our OptiCore loop, we know we have the 56 input rack we also have two additional SD mini racks and an orange box. We need to find them. So we're going to go to the Conform All Ports tab, push it, and confirm it. You will see the ports being added on the OptiCore loop. You will now notice that there are a bunch of connections that are in red right now. What that means is that the audio paths need to be remapped. Under Setup OptiCore, there's a button that says remap all OptiCore. Now I've seen a common mistake here where people hit remap all OptiCore and then someone else in the OptiCore loop will hit remap and it'll be like a game of tennis. Remap, remap, remap. So it's really important that you have some sort of communication between all the other people on your loop. What Tater and I do a lot is get on the comm at this point and say, hey, I'm gonna remap, so hold on. So in this case, I'm letting Tater know that I'm remapping. Remap all OptiCore and confirm. 
Now that you can see all our ports are green and the devices are all connected, now is a great time to save the session as we have just built the basic building blocks of our OptiCore loop connected with the SD racks. Save session. The next thing that we like to do is create OptiCore console send and receive ports. This is a way to get audio paths around to other consoles on the same OptiCore loop. The way that we utilize this in Iron Maiden is, I play the intros to songs like Number of the Beast, Woe to You, O Earth and Sea. Well, that audio information needs to get to the stage as well. By using the OptiCore console send and receive ports, we are able to send that information to all the other consoles on the OptiCore loop. Pooch creates a console send from the Add Port tab in the Audio I.O. page. Then remaps all. Tater conforms all. The console receive port linked to my send port I just created is discovered and added automatically on Tater's desk. Tater then remaps all. Tater now has to create his console send from the add port tab in the audio I.O. Tater then remaps all. Pooch conforms all. The console receive port linked to my send port I just created is discovered and added automatically on Pooch's desk. Pooch remaps all, and we are now ready to use the audio pass we just created. At this point, it's time to do that thing that we always love to do, which is save. We're going to need more than eight audio paths, just in case the band or back line have additional requests. Adding ports to the con send and receive is very easy. Tater needs to be doing the same things that I'm doing over here on the opposite ports. So for instance, when I add eight more paths on my send, he's going to be adding eight more paths on his receive and vice versa. Let's go up here to cards and sockets. Let's select that second card slot and we're going to add a con audio to the receive and the send and Tater is gonna do that on the other end as well. Once he's done that, we're gonna remap. We don't use the video slots that are automatically created from the console send and receive ports, but I do use the video screen on the meter bridge of the Q7 via the BNC connector on the back of the console. For instance, on the Iron Maiden tour, the monitor position is stage left. Though I can see downstage center quite well, the upstage drum riser is completely blocked from my sight line. So my workaround was to get Don, the video director, to give me a feed to my BNC in the back of the desk. Now I can see the drummer acknowledging all the cues I am delivering to him. The next thing that we like to do is patch the first 56 channels to the 56 inputs on the SD stage rack. This can be achieved very simply by using a function called ripple channels. If we come up here to the top of the first channel and we pull up the input section where you can see all of the ports, at the top of that is something labeled ripple channels. Well, when you select the SD rack and then put in ripple channels 56, I can now select the very first input of that SD rack and it will ripple all 56 inputs into my first 56 channels. Now, Tater, I know there's something else that you like to do when we're doing this setup. What is it that you do? Okay, well, since this is the first time we're trying out the line system to the SD rack, I like to add phantom power to all the lines. The best way to do that is with my left thumb, hit the option all, Click at the top of the input strip, hit the 48 volts, and all 12 on that surface 
will become phantom powered. Now, you can go to the Options tab, under Surface, Global Second Function, apply to whole console instead of just one surface, and that'll do everything. But I like to work in groups of 12. Over here on my console, you'll notice in the first 12 inputs, the Phantom Power is shown being activated. That's because Tater did that on his console in a rack that we are sharing in the OptiCore loop. One of the last things that we like to do is a little trick that maybe not a whole lot of you out there know about. Under the file menu is something called global set to defaults, all right? This is a way to do a bunch of things very easily across my console with the hit of one button, all right? So the way that I use this is with my input channels, I want all of my filters on and I want all of my EQ on. Now by doing that, what that means is, is that every time that I reach for a channel, I don't have to turn on my cue and turn on my filters. Those are things that I always pretty much touch on any channel anyway. I want those to be activated and ready to go. The next thing that I do is under my output section, AUGS outputs for example, I want all of my outputs to be faders at zero, ready to send information out. So what I do here is under AUGS outputs, I go faders to zero. You will now see that all of the AUGS sends have gone to zero. We do that again with group outputs, for example. Here you go. Now all my group outputs are faders at zero. And my matrix outputs, faders at zero. Tater, I know you like to do a couple of other things with global set to defaults. What's that? Well, I think I take a little bit more basic approach. On my input channels, I like to have my filters on, my EQ on, and my mutes on. On my aux outs, I like to have the mutes on. I like to do this because when I'm trying to start building a mix, I like to unmute the channels individually and bring the fader to zero myself. This is a pretty good starting point and we are ready to start smiling and dialing. If we have further information from the artist, this is the point where we would be labeling inputs, deciding on bus routing, and inserting presets both on the console and in Waves. Thanks so much for watching, and if you have questions for either of us, you can find us on Facebook or Instagram at Wrong End of the Snake.